The world is getting weirder, darker every single day. Things are spinning around faster and faster, and threatening to go completely awry. Falcons and falconers. The center cannot hold, but in my corner of the country, I'm trying to nail things down. I don't want to live in Victor's jungle, even if it did eventually devour him. I don't want to live in a world where the strong rule and the weak cower. I'd rather make a place where things are a little quieter, where trolls stay under their bridges and elves don't come swooping out to snatch children from their cradles, where vampires respect the limits, and where the fairies mind their P's and Q's. My name is Harry Blackstone Copperfield Dresden. Conjure by it at your own risk. When things get strange, when what goes bump in the night flicks on the lights, when no one else can help you, give me a call. I'm in the book. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I'll be your gaming monk for the evening. Let's talk a bit about game evolution, of a sense. I've always believed that game design doesn't happen necessarily in a vacuum. As the saying goes, art draws upon other art. And it's easy to see the influences and or inspirations in a work within said work's DNA. To use a video game example, look at the original Devil May Cry, whose fixed camera angles, use of keys, and tight placements show the vestiges of the Resident Evil game it was originally intended to be. D&D has some similar quirks, for example. It's building off of TSR's previous game, Chainmail. Often, you have an instance where the spin-off of a core goes in such a different direction that it develops an identity all its own. This brings us to Fantastic Adventures in Tabletop Entertainment, better known as the Fate System from Evil Hat Games. What started as an open-source variant of the Fudge System has taken on a life of its own over the years. It was already a popular system thanks to Spirit of the Century, but that popularity snowballed thanks to this week's subject matter. The Dresden Files. Jim Butcher's take on urban fantasy that can quickly be summarized as, what if people brooded less in the world of darkness? Granted, that is a vast, vast oversimplification, but there's plenty of videos covering the many players within this setting, big and small. I'm here to discuss the role-playing game, arguably the most popular setting for Fate. How does it hold up? Well, let's find out. Dresden Files is split into two books, Your Story at 418 pages and Our World at 274 pages. Both books have a very journal style of presentation that's quite in-universe, with the assumption that Harry and a few others have passed these books around. The sidebars read like cliff notes and responses to cliff notes, along with post-its acting like text boxes. In addition, there's a fair amount of comic style art that helps give a visual reinforcement of its themes, which stick to that visual theme of this being someone's journal. The writing keeps this casual tone in addition to that, and my only real nitpick would be the placement of some chapters, more so in your story, as it seems a little bit roundabout in some places. Last but not least, both books have an index. A stellar presentation, all things considered. Given that Dresden Files is an urban fantasy setting, this is an ideal opportunity to bring back an old character of mine, Alden Zavok Robinson, Death's Bounty Hunter. I'll be bending the lore a little bit to make it fit, and I may dedicate a Characters with Character entry to Alden down the line. The zeroth step, as this is typically assigned by the GM, is to choose a power level, how deep in the supernatural world the character is. This choice has repercussions down the line, and we'll be going with chest deep in this regard, which gives us a skill cap of plus 5, 30 skill points, and 8 refreshes. The first proper step is choosing the template we qualify for. Of the available ones, we'll go with Sorcerer. In doing so, we should bear in mind the required powers and suggested skills. Second step is High Concept and Trouble, which are the first two aspects that can be summarized as what you do and what makes doing that difficult. Respectively, we'll be going with Afterlife Cop and Skilled Outlier in the family. This is reflective of the fact that Alden's job is to help the dead find peace and punish those who violate the rules of death a role he was technically not supposed to have in the family, but is begrudgingly granted. The third step concerns the character's background, divided into four phases. Background, Rising Conflict, Story, and Guest Starring. Each phase has a shortened version that acts as an aspect, much like High Concept and Trouble. Respectively, the aspects we have are Family, Akiel, 
cynical optimist, rebellious, and negotiator. The fourth step is skills. Because of our power level, we have 30 points to spend on skills, with no skill rated higher than plus 5. We'll be going with conviction, discipline, lore, presence, and endurance at plus 3, scholarship, contacts, empathy, athletics, and investigation at plus 2, and fists, weapons, might, resources, and alertness at plus 1. It should be noted that skills are kind of in a pyramid setup. In other words, you can't have more skills at a higher rank than you do at a lower one. For example, you can't have three skills at plus two and only two skills at plus one, but you can have the opposite. The fifth step is stunts and powers, which is based on your refresh level. Refresh level is based on the power level that we discussed beforehand, and the minimum of this is one. We'll be spending three refresh points each on the required evocation and thaumaturgy with an additional one in sight, leaving us with a refresh of one and thus one fate point will be generated during lulls in action. The reason for the one refresh minimum is that a refresh of zero indicates those individuals who have completely surrendered to their instincts and or impulses. Lastly, our stress levels. We have three stress tracks between physical, mental, and social that start at two and are increased by the endurance, conviction, and presence skills respectively. This makes our tracks at five for all three. Character creation is heavily dressed up, but amounts to a few stages of point spending. This is a method more for people who have a full character concept and backstory in their mind in advance, than it is for those who prefer having a few bullet points and building the rest through play. That's not to say the latter is a bad thing, it's just not as compatible in this game. That said, I'm a bit iffy on the budget of stunts, since that cuts into the whole extra effort systems that we'll get into later. I like it, but for some I could see it asking them to be amateur writers themselves. Being an offsuit of fudge, Fate uses the fudge dice for its systems. Now these dice are custom d6s that go for plus minus instead of numbers. Two plus faces, two minus faces, and two neutral faces. When using a skill, you roll four of these dice and add or subtract from that skill based on the die results. This total is subtracted from the roll's difficulty, and the final number is compared to the latter to determine degrees of success. Alternatively, you can roll two normal d6 and use the difference between the two dice, but this is an at-your-own-risk method as it potentially may cause the results to become more volatile. That said, the majority of rolls in conflict will be contested ones instead of using static difficulties. Damage is treated as stress, and instead of being straight wound points, it's more akin to a threshold system. In other words, if you already have three stress, you need to suffer three damage in order to be inflicted with four stress, four for five, and so on. To reduce stress, you can select a consequence, a kind of wound or status effect that lowers damage, but carries its own unique debilitations for the short and long term. This will also award a fate point. Fate points are the game's extra effort, but it's more of a narrative tool than in other games. This is primarily tied to the aspects we delved into beforehand, as you can invoke a relevant aspect to allow for a reroll or gain plus two bonus to the roll at the cost of a fate point. You can also gain a fate point to let an aspect be negatively used against you. And furthermore, you can create temporary aspects in the middle of play by using appropriate skill roll. Now spellcasting, the claim to fame of course, since the main character is a wizard, is freeform and split into two types, evocation and thaumaturgy. Evocation is the quick and dirty spell and comes in the form of attack, block, maneuver, and counter spell. Before casting the spell, you declare how many shifts you'll be allocating to the spell. In other words, how powerful it is. The soft cap of this is based on the character's conviction skill. After this is picked, you take one mental stress, plus an additional point of mental stress for each shift over your conviction. The total shifts is the difficulty for a discipline roll that you make, on which a success means you successfully cast the spell. A failure in this roll can result in a backlash, where you take the stress based on the negative difference, or a fallout where the consequence affects the area as determined by the GM. As a final note on evocation, the lore skill can allow you to have rote spells, ones that are muscle memory to you. In this instance, your lore skill rating negates the need to roll discipline for spells with an equal amount of shifts. Thaumaturgy, on the other hand, is more akin to ritual spells. Obviously, this method requires time and some kind of symbolic connection. Not necessarily a physical item, but some similar kind of component that has value. The first step is determining the power that is needed to cast the spell, listed as complexity. 
The soft cap for this is lore, of which excess complexity can be bought off by skipping scenes, using consequences, or invoking aspects. After this, you may invest power akin to evocation, taking mental stress for any power over your discipline. The final power is rolled as a difficulty in a discipline roll. On a success, that power is invested into the spell's complexity, and the process is repeated until the total power equals the spell's complexity. Failure in the process results in backlash or fallout, similar to evocation but arguably more dangerous, as all the power invested in the spell at that point hits either you or the environment. Fate has a lot of dressing for the mechanics, but it remains solely narrativist. This is a double-edged sword, as I think it's going to rely on intangibles based on the players you have. Much like with similar metatag-based mechanics, such as Shadowrun Anarchy, which we've covered in the past, I think a clear line needs to be demonstrated between a good aspect and a bad one to prevent abuse. To use an example, 13th Age's One Unique Thing had a couple pages dedicated to what's a great example, what's a good example, and what's a bad example. One aspect I didn't delve into with this review is the city creation system, which kind of reminds me of the playsheet system in the previously reviewed Technoir, though not as story seed based as that one was. Magic is definitely overpowered, especially given the amount of freedom the two spell styles have. It's going to be determinant on the GM to rein things in narratively. That's a bit of a theme for this game as well. It's understandable why this game won so many awards, as well as became the poster child for the Fate system for several years. Combining an accessible system with a strong setting makes this a fine quality RPG that hits a proverbial sweet spot. This might not be as enticing if you're more akin to detailed crunch than narrative collaboration, but fortunately the system doesn't go quite story game, nor does it bottleneck personalization. As such, I'm willing to give the game a stamp of strongly recommended. Not the most surprising revelation, I'm sure, but sometimes that's the way the dice lay out. Personally, I'd be a little less stingy on refresh in order to allow the full breadth of powers and stunts that have some room to breathe, but I'm aware that might interfere with the simplistic design. Either way, fans of narrativist-style games and urban fantasy owe it to themselves to grab this one, especially since it's flexible enough to work with similarly-themed franchises.